started uh, with our program today. Welcome everybody, and uh, thanks to Anne and the um, facilities at Rockingham Free Library for allowing us to uh, to Zoom and do this in person. So <laughs> second time doing this. We did our, we did it last uh, two months ago in June on the, at Brooks Library, and so I think we've worked out the kinks finally. <laughs> so. Um, Glad to have everybody here. Uh, we could do a real quick uh, introduction if the people in the uh, remote would like to uh, put something in the chat uh, about where you're from and uh, anything else you'd like to say. Say, and then uh, uh, the people in person can introduce themselves if they like. Uh, so, on my left here is Wayne. Aren't you? Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be doing part of the presentation. We're going to be doing the uh, Revolution of War Tensions. I'm Jerry Carboni, as you know, regulars here. And behind me, I hope you can see our hat. It's the uh, programming person here. And then we'll just go on the room if you like. Wendy Gabriel, uh, Jesse. Okay. What do you, what's your interest today? Uh, just interested in, uh, I haven't been to any of these meetings because I'm usually teaching or doing other things. Oh, okay. In the last three years, I've been not meeting. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, I've, I've been working with family genealogy since I was 18. Oh, wow. I'm almost 80. So. Okay. That's what we're all about here. I'm Mary Ann Remolador. I'm from Springfield. Um, I find that these meetings are a great way to get me motivated to do the research that I keep saying I want to do. So that's one of the reasons why I came and just to learn about these different resources that are available. I'm Carol Handy. I'm the regent for the Brattleboro chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution. But I'm here because I have a personal person I'm trying to find from Scotland and I'm getting a lot of roadblocks. So I'm very nice. Yeah. Uh, I'm Kathy and I'm from Bradwell and Jerry's wife. <laughs> Just hang in. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Bedford uh, from Ludlow. Uh, saw it in the uh, Vermont Journal. Uh, very curious. I've been doing the answer for a couple of years. Again, running into roadblocks. Uh, uh, interested because my wife's family goes back to the revolution uh, and uh, want to find out more about uh, her ancestors. Uh, one, well, they were from Maine. Um, one father and three sons uh, went with Ebenezer and Francis at the defense of Boston and then spread out from there during the revolution trying to track it down. So, yeah, so you have. A lot heavier there. Is this your first meeting with us? Yes. Oh, okay. yes, it is. And it's the first time I knew it was great. We have it. And, you know, I maybe it was in the Vermont Journal yeah. uh, before, but the article that they, uh, I think it was through Ron Patch, uh, yeah. had it, uh, you know, struck my interest. And my wife pointed out, so hey, that, you know, So leave us with your email address and we'll put you I on did. the list. Okay. I did one I registered on. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get from there on the next. I'm Connie Lancaster from Saxton River. I'm researching and doing genealogy and history, historical research for as long as I can remember. And I've been attending these uh, sessions and every time I learn something new and so I um, wouldn't want to miss this one. Nice to be here in person. And that's everybody who is in the <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> so we have uh, David Maholan, Westminster West, Ken Cannon in Brattleboro, Carl Ball, Saxons River, Chip Howard, who's down in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, who grew up in Douglas Falls. Chip's been coming to just about every one of these uh, remotely, and Michael from Brattleboro. And uh, David again, so let's see if I can close this thing. <laughs> okay, 
Great. So uh, here's our little agenda. We'll start off with uh, Wayne's presentation and uh, have about 30 minute with 10 minute Q&A. And then I'll talk to we'll talk about a little bit about fold three. And then we'll uh, go on to the genealogy puzzle. And uh, hopefully you guys got to work on that and see if you solved it. And then we can have just a general uh, genealogy discussion and any topics you want to see for our next meeting, which we set for Saturday, November 5th at Brooks Library in Emerson. So uh, it's uh, here and I'll stop my share so that Wayne can do his thing. Do that. All right. Um, so the um, <clears throat> if you have family ancestors that go back to the uh, Revolutionary War, uh, you might be fortunate enough to find that some of them survived the war and uh, lived long enough to actually claim one of these pensions that the government provided. Um, for the longest time, I, I, uh, I was pretty skeptical and didn't pay much attention to it. But then I did find one um, uh, four times great grandparents, a set of grandparents, actually, that, um, that were, uh, had extensive information in, in the uh, application. So I thought I'd, I'd show you how to find that and give you some examples of some of the things that I found. So the, um, uh, to start with, Congress did not provide a whole lot. Uh, there were some disabled veterans that uh, received a pension, um, but it was not until uh, after 1818 that uh, people who served in the Army and Navy became eligible. Um, but they also needed to show that they had, uh, they not only had to show that they were a veteran, but they had to show that they had reduced the circumstances. You know, basically they were, uh, uh, disabled or couldn't, you know, not necessarily totally disabled, but couldn't provide for themselves. And let's face it, most people, most of the people at that time were farmers. And if they just physically were no longer able to do that. Or if they were a widow um, of, of a veteran and could not, uh, had more of a difficult time taking care of herself, um, then they could provide, they could apply for a pension. But uh, of course, uh, just as of today, <laughs> uh, a lot of proof needed to be required proof of your service, proof that. Um, you needed uh, you needed help, um, so that generated a lot of paperwork. And in somewhere in those in that paperwork was a lot of useful information for um, finding about the family history. So there might be things like affidavits from uh, men who served together, uh, so that they could kind of verify the service because record keeping wasn't the greatest during the Revolutionary War period. Um, they had to show, you know, basically what they had for property, uh, how much money they had. Um, widows uh, needed to prove uh, that their husband had passed away, and they also needed to prove that they had proved that they were married. And they were the widow, and sometimes you can find information about the children in the family as well. So anyway, those are some of the things that we're looking for. So places to look. Um, the National Archives website itself uh, has these records. And uh, I guess I would refer you to our the meeting from a couple months ago. If, if you, uh, you, would, you might need to review that and search through the National Archives website, because uh, I, I don't find it that easy to use, but I don't use it that much. So. Um, Anyway, that, so that's a good source. Um, 
Heritage Quest was also excellent, but the, at least here in Vermont, the Department of Libraries uh, stopped the funding it. Uh, it used to be available for free at the library and you could actually access, you could get a code and access it from home. But uh, if, unless you're in one of the lucky places that still do that, uh, Heritage Quest, uh, it's not available here at Vermont Libraries anymore. Can you talk a little bit about what information can be found on Heritage Quest? Heritage Quest, um, uh, well, all these Revolutionary War records were, are available, uh, census records. Uh, they had a lot of digitized books um, that were, could be, you know, I mean, there were a lot of other sites that had digitized books, but this was one of them. They had a whole collection of digitized books. They had, um, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact name of it. It's like the Freeman's Bank. Uh, it, it's basically designed for uh, newly freed slaves in order to get money. So there was a whole there was a whole section on that. On the city directory. So, I don't know the city directory. So. Um, anyway, there were there were a lot of useful things on there. Uh, the information I got was just they stopped doing it because the information is available in other places. So. Uh, uh, FamilySearch.org uh, uh, does have an index. I'll give you some examples of that in a minute. Fold3 that Jerry's going to talk about. They're the company that digitized all of the images for the National Archives. And Fold3 does require a subscription. Ancestry.com uh, also has Revolutionary War pension and, and uh, pension application files. And uh, they, uh, my heritage, another commercial website. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to just quickly run, just show you some screen examples of those. Um, so anyway, on the national at the National Archives, what you're looking for is the Revolutionary War Pension and Bounty Land Warrant Application Files. So they are. It says here an estimated 80,000 pension applications. And of course, each application has multiple documents inside the application itself. Um, the, the, uh, we'll have uh, all the stuff saved on, on, online. Um, so the, the, the slides and our, and our recording today will be. Uh, I'll also be available afterwards if you want to go back and look at some of these links. Um, so National Archives, this is a screenshot of the National Archives website. Uh, what you're doing, what you want to look for is where it says researching our records. Um, obviously, there's a lot more there than just pension applications, so you need, need to narrow it down. Uh, the uh, place to go, although I guess there's more than one place uh, on the website, but you can search the catalog. Uh, you can, uh, I, well, I'll give you an example in a second here, but the, the, uh, you can start by just typing in the name of the person you're looking for and hope you, you might luck out. Or you can click through and research under the section on researching military records. Uh, once you open that up, you're looking for a button that says the American Revolutionary War. And then inside of there, you want to put down the pension records. So they do, you know, they, they do have a way to kind of move through the uh, website. Um, so I, I started here with just a simple search for this ancestor called Caleb Marshall. And uh, fortunately, I got a lucky break. It came up on the first page. <laughs> so you might not be so lucky, just to warn you. Um, but anyway, so and under here, you can, as you can see, it uh, takes you to his application file, this W18486. 
Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, it found it within that section of, of the website. Um, so you click on, you open the file. It was a link that opened uh, the first page of 116 other pages as part of this pension, app pension application uh, submitted by Caleb's widow, uh, Zariah. Um, so anyway, if you find it in the National Archives, um, first of all, yeah, um, the, the entire file will be there if they've digitized that file. And they have done, by the way, they have digitized the uh, Revolutionary War records are uh, complete, essentially. Um, and the, you know, so it's free. If you if you if you had to submit a request for it, it's a fee in order to get the National Archives to send you the record. But you can look it up. If, you know, look it up on their website. If it's all there, you, you've got the entire record. The records were digitized by Fold Three, um, and so they're also available on that website. Um, we'll, we'll get into more about Fold Three later. Uh, okay, so uh, just to quickly kind of run through the other sites. On Family Search, the collection is called um, United States Revolutionary War Pension and Bounty Land Warrant Applications 1800 to 1900. Um, when you go into that file, you see something that looks like this. And again, I was able to find Caleb there. Um, up on the right hand side, it gives you kind of a thumbnail sketch of, of you know, uh, his uh, information. Uh, the uh, thing is, though, as you can see here on the screen, um, it says view on fold three. So there are no, there are no images on family search itself. It's really kind of an index to find the information. But again, it could be useful if, uh, again, that pension number is an important number uh, if you're, you know, looking for information. Um, so, uh, oh, all right. Well, so it takes you to, uh, I got I added this one. Um, so it just warns you that you're leaving family search. If you click that link, uh, it basically means, like I said, the images are not available on Family Search, but it's taking you to a link that takes you to Fold Three. Fold Three screen looks like this. Uh, as you can see there, it says uh, there's over 10 million records. Again, that's not people, but those are the records, uh, and it's 99% digitized. Um, so it includes the entire pension file rec records. Or soldiers and sailors in the revolution. Uh, there's sometimes if you search these things, they'll they uh, have pulled out selected records that they think are useful for genealogy. Um, but it, frankly, I always want to know what they left out. So it's kind of nice to see that entire file, even though uh, some of the papers may not be relevant to what you're looking for. Um, on Ancestry, uh, again, Ancestry, you, you need to have an account in order to look, look it up, but it is available here in the library and it's available in Brooks Library. Uh, so you're looking for, again, the database is the name is very, it's basically the same as the other names. Um, you look, you need to look for it. What I would suggest doing is you can look for it in their cat ancestors catalog so that you're just searching within that one database. Uh, a couple of words of warning here though, ancestors catalog is not like using Google. You know, if you mess up on Google, Google will give you some other suggestions that they think what you're looking for. This one doesn't do that. If, if you don't type in something that's exact to what they have, you, you'll, You'll come up with nothing. They just say you can't find anything. Um, so uh, don't give up if you're using that. Uh, you just need to try a little different combination of words to find what you're looking for. If you already have an ancestry tree, 
and, and you're looking for something for about that person in the tree, I, I would suggest go, just going there and then looking under military records for that person. Um, probably speeds it up. This pension database does include images. Um, so just to show you what this looks like, on the left there is a pull down menu under search. You want to go to the card catalog. Inside the card catalog, I just typed Revolutionary War Pension. Like I said, sometimes you type stuff in there and then you get no results. And it just means it's frustrating because a lot of times I know that there's a file in there. I just got to butt type the right word. But anyway, those words seem to work. And it came up where the red arrow is there with the Revolutionary War Pension files, uh, that database. So then you click there, it takes you to, you know, you can search inside that one database. Um, and uh, it really, all, at that point, you probably only need the person's name. You don't necessarily need to know other, have other information in there. Um, searching this again, I just, you know, I just put in Caleb, it came up with, um, Applied from New Hampshire, or actually, his widow is the one that applied. Um, is that Zula? Then there's any other applicants? Zula. Yeah, that's his wife, mm -hmm. Zora Zoraya. Oh, Zoraya. Yeah. Um, she, she's the one that uh, applied, actually. Um, Caleb actually died in 1800, so he was he didn't make it all the way to the point where he could even apply for an application for a pension. But, his widow did not a number of years later. It could only apply after 18. Yeah, you know, so you have to. Uh, it, and even then, I, I think it was even when, even later than that, that they had other pension, you know, acts Congress passed because I don't think she she didn't apply until like in 1830s. I don't know. She lived a long life. <laughs> yeah. But that's a long time to live. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, oh, so just quickly, the last one I have here. Um, you can also, on my heritage, if you're if you subscribe to that, um, um, they also have a uh, database. It's. Uh, I think this might even be free to search, even if you don't have it. Um, it's basically just another index. So uh, just to show you what some of the screens look like. Um, so you're looking for Revolutionary War pension records. Again, you just type in a name. Um, the, um, it's useful if you, I mean, if you already subscribe to my heritage, it can certainly be useful to. Um, I, I wouldn't suggest subscribing just for that purpose. There are other ways to get these records that are much better. Um, the interesting thing that my heritage does, though, is they kind of extract all of the names that they found in in the file, uh, which really kind of surprised me there. So, in other words, people that wrote letters, people signed affidavits. I mean, it, under additional, yeah, under additional names, um, it, it's like somebody has gone through and just. Tag all of the names that are in that file. Um, you probably so do it for, for their for their, <coughs> for their family trees there. Yeah, the family yeah, they trees, connect the family trees. They do DNA as well, well, so you can research the DNA. So uh, anyway, that was one a unique little twist uh, with that one. So anyway, so some things that you might find. You find something about the person's service record. Um, you generally will find statements from people that served with the veteran. Um, hopefully, you also can determine when uh, when the person died. Uh, there should be some documentation in there as well, because because the pen, you know, if you're successful in getting a pension, it obviously it stops when you die. So. They usually record that date in the file or somewhere too. Um, 
would have needed to provide uh, additional information. I needed to show that they were married. Um, and then with these <laughs> other statements from people who knew the couple, maybe other family members or neighbors. Um, a lot of times people needed a lot of other documentation to say prove who they were um, in order to in order to get the pension. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few examples of things that, that I found in there. This was an interesting one. Um, but we can't see. I'm going to go through some of these in a little more detail just because it was kind of a neat document to find. But this is correspondence. I, I suspect it was probably somebody that wanted to apply to either the um, Daughters of the American Revolution or the Sons of the American Revolution. And then, so this is a reply by somebody, I assume, at the archive there. It just says administration or something like that. Anyway, he kind of gives a whole summary of what's in the file. Um, so I'm, I'm just to give you some examples to. Oh, well, for, before I do that, it, this, this was interesting to me. The, so this is, a, this is basically a marriage certificate. So they, were, they got married in the town of Hampstead, New Hampshire. So the town clerk is the first paragraph up there, uh, certifying that they got married on the 4th of March in 1772 by the Reverend Henry True. Then the next paragraph, the justice of the peace attests that the town clerk is a man of good character and reputation and whose statements are entitled to full weight, subscribed and made solemn oath to the truth of the foregoing certificate. So you got a justice of the peace that's verifying that the town clerk's a good guy and you can trust what he says. Then in the next paragraph, you've got the clerk for the Rockingham County Court certifying that the justice of the peace is who he says he is. <laughs> so you have to go through a lot. Oftentimes I've found uh, similar to the uh, postmaster was another Interesting, trusted sort of person in the community. Most trusted um, should have been the librarian. <laughs> should have been the librarian. <laughs> First, do everybody in. So, anyway, you yeah. had to go through a lot to, uh, <laughs> you know, basically, it's like you make the statement, that the other person is notarizing the statement, the other person is verifying that the notary is a good person. <laughs> So any, just uh, these are other, other documents in there. The, this paragraph again was a summary, but uh, there's actual uh, an affidavit in the file. It, basically, in her own words, she described, you know, basically her service to the country, and the, uh, the, uh, as, well as, as a couple. So then I just quickly run through this. Uh, I'll, I'll read it. It's probably not that easy to see on the screen. But so after their marriage. Caleb Marshall and his wife moved to Northumberland, New Hampshire. And when the revolution began, the people of that place lived in fear and alarm. And uh, this, is, this is very northern New Hampshire, right on the Vermont border. Um, so they were a little close to Canada. Um, anyway, uh, fear and alarm. And it, there's a couple of instances here where it's a young wife. She decided, you know, that it was too dangerous to stay there. So she went through the woods uh, to back to her hometown in Hampstead, New Hampshire, carrying her eight-week-old child. And there was another time where she and her husband both fled, and this time they had two small children. Um, they ended up having 12 children in all, but so this was early in their marriage and they had these two kids. So um, they fled back to Hampstead, which is about 170 miles through, you know, through the woods. So it was a, must have been a multi-day trip on horseback. Um, and after this, so a company of soldiers was sent to Northumberland to protect the inhabitants and a blockhouse and a fort was built. And they used the Marshall home as kind of the center of this fort. So basically they built a fortified blockhouse and fort around their home. Um, and soldiers were quartered there uh, to, you know, and inhabitants of the town fled there from whenever it was uh, 
rage of some sort was threatened. Uh, anyway, just to give you a little visual here. Uh, the uh, Today you can make the trip in two hours and 41 minutes. <laughs> Going right down Interstate 93 primarily. But <laughs> uh, so anyway, I just wanted to give a sense of uh, Northumberland's up there on the Connecticut River, the far the northern part of Connecticut River. And Hampstead is down in you know, southeastern New Hampshire. So like I said, uh, it must have, you know, and I'm not, I don't do any horseback riding, but I don't think you can make a horse go like quite that far all in a day. Find out how many days it would take. Uh, anyway, so that was, I don't, I mean, it was just an example of some of the documents in there that were really pretty fascinating to me. She broke this all, you know. Well, I don't know that she wrote it herself, but she dictated it to a, like a justice of the peace that somebody verified her story that what they did during the revolution. Um, and he also, his service also included some service with the New Hampshire militia and some service with the Vermont militia, um, most of it up in the northern part of the states. Uh, so, uh, it, it was kind of fascinating to me that he served as a private a lieutenant and a captain. So you don't usually make it through the ranks quite that fast, but the uh, it was in his house, so he was, um, you know, he was basically in charge. Um, he was often in command at the fort at his house. So he did scouting and spy duty. Um, it was stated that uh, he, he and his wife Betty cared for the soldiers in the house and for. That's the few people who came to the fort, people looking for protection. Uh, uh, oh, there were there were some letters in there from uh, some of their children. They had 12, 12 kids, eight daughters and four sons. Um, the, uh, only a couple of them were named because it's in this paragraph, it's fuzzy to read it. Uh, it's not because of our screen, it's because of the typing. But, uh, type um, anyway, they, a couple of the daughters also provided letters, so that's how we know it was, uh, it was Mary and uh, Fanny, her sister. There. The daughter Mary was uh, kind of a, um, she, in her day, was really a strong advocate for women's rights, essentially. <laughs> she basically spent her life as an activist, so I, I'm not surprised that she was writing letters advocating for her mother. Um, so she wrote this letter basically explaining that the uh, her father's commanding officer, this Captain Ames, was turned Tory. In other words, basically he was a traitor to the revolutionary cause and uh, was forced out. So what she's saying there is that uh, because her father ended up basically being in command, uh, that this Captain Ames never really know, never really recorded all the service that was, you know, that Caleb Marshall uh, was fighting. Had, you know, they, they didn't really document all of his service. Um, and I guess you know Ames probably had no motivation to do that. I don't know where he went, but. <laughs> I'm not sure what happened to him. Uh, but anyway, he, uh, he uh, was a traitor to the cause. So anyway, uh, what, what they're trying to, what she's trying to advocate in this letter is that there was other service that couldn't be documented because of him. Uh, a lot of letters went back and forth. Uh, like I said, it, it's kind of a side note. I mean, she, uh, a, a lot is known about Mary because she wrote a number of books. Um, she had a horrible experience uh, as a member of the Shaker community um, in uh, Enfield, New Hampshire. So she wrote a number of books kind of blasting the Shakers. Um, <laughs> her, 
her father, I mean her father, her husband joined, she went with him. They had like four kids. And then once they joined, uh, she really had, was forbidden to have any contact with her kids. They're gonna be raised by the Shakers, not by her. Um, so she basically spent the rest of her life um, petitioning the New Hampshire State Legislature. She was trying to force them to basically uh, give her, you know, advocating for a divorce from her husband and wanting custody of her kids is really what it came down to. But, I mean, that's a little side. Do you know if she ever achieved that goal? Uh, not really. I mean, yes, she finally, I mean, her, after like a couple of petitions to the state legislature, she finally got free of her husband. Um, the uh, She never really was able to reunite with her kids. I think one, only one of the other kids left the Shakers. She had, uh, she had contact with him, but, uh, you know, it was, I, I get the sense from her books. It wasn't that, you know, it was never really a happy ending <laughs> in that sense. But anyway, she was a strong, she wrote a number of letters here as part of this application. Um, the actually the pension file is um, um, so their, their deaths are recorded here as well in, in this, this whole document. Um, this whole thing with Zoraya though it, it really had kind of a sad ending. She she was successful in getting a pension, and then I'm not sure exactly what happened. Uh, there's a lot of like I said, there's over 100 documents there. So um, if you go through and look at them all, I suspect you can piece it together. But she was eventually accused of fraud. And I think part of the fraud came about because she felt she was also eligible for a pension in Vermont because her husband also served with the Vermont militia as well as the New Hampshire militia. So she got into some trouble there. And then there was the whole question of just how long he had served in, you know, in, in, uh, in the army, in the militia. So anyway, um, you know, basically the government wanted its money back. <laughs> you know, so it was, <laughs> that, that's what that, I think that's what Mary got involved in her other daughter, one of her other daughters, you know, the wonder. petitioning them, you know. Um, she did, you know, she lived until age 88. Anyway, I, I, uh, I didn't think I would find anything and there's a, this whole story that, that I just found fascinating about uh, what they went, you know, what it was like basically for a family to uh, live, you know, basically live through the Revolutionary War. So that's kind of takes the end of my piece here. Anyway. Anything I've totally confused people on? <laughs> well, I'd like to know, was that a random choice? Or is were Caleb and Zaluba, are they part of your family? No, you yeah, know, your no, ancestry? they're my uh, great, 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 great grandparents. Yes. <laughs> so and no, you, I was researching. And, and you, you know, opened it up with hundreds of, hundreds of documents. <laughs> so you descend from the 12th. <laughs> I, yeah, I descended from Nancy. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's a question from Michael Bosworth in the chat. Uh, maybe Carolyn might like to answer this. <laughs> Can you tell us more about the Daughters of the American Revolution? When did they start? Who was eligible? Why was it important? Don't well, push on the spot. But... <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember when they started. I have them put it up online. Anyone who's eligible would have to be able to prove their ancestry to someone who served in the Revolutionary War. They may not have served as a soldier. Some women have served. You might have served as someone who kept records or provided food or something like that. But the DAR also has a lot of documents, even a book with 
Native Americans and African Americans and mixed race people who also served in the American Revolution. So just because you're of that different heritage doesn't mean you won't qualify. They were founded in 1890. 1890, okay. The, uh, I actually run, I, I thought something was wrong. I ran across one ancestor who was, turned out to be a real daughter and I couldn't figure out why there was no genealogy there, but she was the daughter of a revolutionary soldier. <laughs> so, <laughs> so all she did was submit her, <laughs> you know, yes, I'm the daughter of so-and-so. Uh, the DAR, by the way, has an excellent website in terms of uh, searching, you know, if you, if you find, uh, uh, well, it, it helps, piece together a genealogy because you have to become a member, you have to prove your whole lineage. Feel free to pop in here, but but basically you've got to prove who your parents, you know, your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents, and so on, um, in order to become a member. Well actually if you can just prove back to your great grandparents, the DAR has most of the other records, ah, they so you just tie. You can just tie in. So if you just provide that information, <clears throat> and most chapters have a registrar or something like that who have this information, and they can just see you know, who you might be descended from. So it's not like the person has to go all the way back to the Revolutionary War. Wow. Okay. And it was started because women did not have access to the male groups. And the information that they already had. So they started this so that they could get the information. Uh -huh. They're now one of the top gathering groups. Go ahead. Um, maybe 20 years ago, uh, when I was helping write a town history, we went to uh, Pittsfield and there was a, a narrow archives there and and we could we, we had the names um of the the residents of the town that we wanted to you know check out and we could go on um you know on their uh, <laughs> machines run the run the reels and actually make copies we could print out the complete files and we oh. did that for it was about 18 um Revolutionary soldiers who had served from Halifax, Vermont. My that that facility closed, and my understanding was that one could go to Waltham, Mass, to and and do the same sort of a search in person. Do you know if the Waltham, right, if that's still available and open? As far as I know, it is. It yeah. is I'm, after COVID and well, <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't been there. Recently. <laughs> but that would be the closest place for someone in New England, perhaps, to go search in person. Uh, Chip, if you want to unmute yourself, you could ask a question. Yeah, um, Wayne, you said that you had to prove. We're not hearing you. <laughs> Something happened with our speaker. Oh, no. We lost our. Let's see. Can you hear me now? I'll put it in the chat. Chip, you want to put it in the chat, we'll ask it for you. Sorry. Okay. No problem. Just un unmute yourself and try to. Yeah, he did. It wasn't. Uh, oh, he's unmuted. Still not working? Yeah. I noticed that it, it gave us a message that it was using another set of speakers. So okay. that's weird because, let me see. Let's see if I can fix this thing. I think I went to that. Yeah, I see that the, the speaker is no longer. Let me try answering the question with my 
thing here. Um, Do you see the speaker that's chosen is the one that's hooked up to the USB? Part? I guess yeah. we're still having problems with the, our speaker here in the room. Um, this is a, it, it should be on, yeah. What if, if I can get this thing to re to come up again? Yeah. Right. Let me just add, try to answer a question here. Then. Yeah, go I, ahead. Um, I'll work on this. The um, in terms of uh, people, it's uh, so, uh, there's a question about um, Alan Bodsworth who in the revolution. Oh, that speaker start up again. Um, Is that working now? I know. Okay. We're, yeah, I think we're okay now. Why the speaker cut out on us? Can you hear um, us now? Anyone? Uh, just in, I okay. to uh, answer a question in general. I mean, if if you have ancestors that lived in, after, you know, during and after the Revolutionary War, especially uh, in the question here, the person that died in 1830 and the widow that died in 1859, um, you know, you, you definitely be worth it to do a search just to see. Um, I mean, there's some 80,000 people in that database, so, uh, you know, I would say give it a, give it a try, see if, it, see if you can find something. Um, about uh, the question about the uh, percentage of vets that actually got a pension, um, that I don't really know. I mean, we have... Oh, the only thing we have to go on, I guess, is, is the, uh, well, that 80,000 figure, you know, I, I'm not sure what that percentage is of, is of uh, the number of people who serve, and I don't really know for sure. The way to tell, uh, let me back up a minute. The, the way to tell if the person actually got a pension is that uh, you can find, that there are index cards with a person's name on it, and it'll list their service, and it will also list a set of numbers. There's a number for the application, and then there's another number to the right of it. And Jerry's going to have some examples here shortly um, of uh, uh, what if it, if it was approved. There's there's a final number on that index card that tells you that they actually got a pension, and then from there, you, then you want to look up the pension record. Um, and if it was a widow, um, I mean, the best number to follow up on is the, the, the final number. You know, the widow had to do a pension application. So that re received a number. And then if she received the pension, it got another number. Uh, uh, some of the examples that I showed there, that, that was that final number is the one that you want to look for if, uh, if you're looking up. You can, especially if you were to contact the National Archives and you wanted to uh, get them to give you a copy of the pension record, um, you, you, you know, you, you need that pension number. Um, I think that's about it. Hey Chip, do you want to just unmute yourself, see if we got the speakers working again? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, all right. Yes. We're good to go. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> So if anybody else would like to ask a question, you can unmute yourself. <laughs> Any other questions? Sorry about the speaker here. We didn't we didn't realize the microphone was cut out on us. I, I have a question. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for the uh, information. It's really helpful. The um, would the records um, uh, denote if a um, if an application was contested and had to be settled someplace else, either in court or by some other means? Uh, there probably would be some documentation in there, but in, in the file itself. I I did not I didn't pursue it. Uh, I haven't gone through all 
hundred plus documents in the file I was talking about. I did, you know, like I said, I ran across some yeah. files where they were um, basically accusing her of fraud, um, but I didn't. Uh, I haven't looked at it that closely, to be honest. But I, I suspect there might be something in the in the uh, file itself, especially if the. I mean, pensions were turned down. You know, so right. If they, didn't, if they couldn't verify the service or some other documents weren't correct, uh, some, you know, somebody might have been denied a pension. Okay. There'd probably be some documentation in the file about that, though. So it wouldn't, there's nothing, uh, there's not a place in a cover sheet then for the, them to, uh, to say that. Not that I run across, but I. Oh, okay, thank you. The, uh, I don't think, uh, I mean, you mentioned, you know, I, mean, I suppose they might've tried to go to court or something and that might be a whole different file altogether in terms of court case. I haven't run across the phone. Thank you. Anybody else? Go ahead, Michael. Uh, yeah, I just want to add my comment that, that it was a great story, Wayne, about the, the Marshalls. Thanks for uh, sharing that. Thanks. They're a fascinating couple. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe we should uh, we move on again. Move on here. On the whole three. Okay, so um, this will be a little bit of a brief intro flyover, as as I like to uh, call it, of the database whole three. So, what is it? So a little bit about the company history. It began in '99 as by archives to uh, digitize records, historical newspapers, and so forth. Uh, 2007, it launched Footnote.com as a database, and as um, uh, Wayne mentioned, that it actually was uh, uh, digitizing records for the uh, National Archives and loading them up on the on the uh, archive site as well as on their uh, on their platform. And in 2010, it, it was acquired by Ancestry and was rebranded as Fold3. And the goal was to become the premier database for military records research. And it, the name comes from the traditional flag folding ceremony in which a third fold is made in honor and remembrance of veterans who served in the defense of their country and to make team peace throughout the world. So I was kind of wondered why it was named that. I know. So here's some facts. Uh, 590 million images. They uh, put 2 million images each month into the database, so they're constantly doing digitization. And what I just found really interesting is non military records, photos, uh, Project Blue Book, which actually has been rebranded now, uh, which was the UFO uh, uh, program that the uh, uh, federal government was looking to, and now has some strange name. That I can't remember now, but it could be. Um, and FBI case files, which I've been able to use, town records, file records, and other things. And it also includes international uh, scope with records from uh, Australia, British, and Irish, Canadian, and New Zealand forces. And so, how much is it? What do you get? So, there is a subscription, uh, and there's also a free part of the database if you get registered for it. So, Cost is about 80 bucks per year, but if you bundle with Ancestry, um, you can get a discount. Um, there are 196 publications that are free, so all you have to do is, is uh, register for the free, uh, a free public. And they're constantly asking you to upgrade, because only have to get part of it, right? So, at any rate, some of the free ones are the War of 1812 Pension Files. Uh, Founding Land Warrant Applications Index, American Battle Monuments Commission, the FBI case files, which are search only. I believe many of these are search only. You're just going to get an index uh, entry for it. But then you can go to the another site perhaps and find the, the uh, information that you're looking for. Uh, Blue Book, as I mentioned, Continental Congress papers, uh, World War II U.S. Air Force photos, 
Pennsylvania archives uh, papers of the Continental Congress and constitutional convention records. So those are just part of the of the three publications. And the FBI case files I'll get into a little bit in the second part of my talk. So here's the home base. When you uh, go into full uh, three years of what you present, you can do a search right away for people's records, places, and dates. I sometimes like to go through it uh, from the uh, categories or war point of view. And that's where you see uh, this uh, here is uh, the uh, United uh, States, Australia, Canada. So you can pick the United States, you can also that, and you can go through the various wars. And that's only part of the titles uh, that, that are there. So, um, so if you do a browse, which I like to do, you can then filter from the browse application. So you get these columns that open up. So on the left, you can you can you can filter the publications by the war. So I've uh, selected the Civil War, and um, there you get publications of all the Civil War. So you get uh, basically um, all of the publications having to do with the Civil War. And then there's a little eye that's next to the uh, to the record, and if you click on that, it will give you uh, the, the uh, description and scope of that publication, and it'll tell you how many records have been uh, digitized, how uh, complete they are, and give you a sample of the record. So that's good if you're not familiar with the uh, collection. You can use that as a way to uh, go into it, um, and um, here are some of the other filters that you can choose to winnow down what you want to search, the collection you want to search. So you just click on those and the list of publications becomes smaller and smaller. Okay, so, um, so for more browsing, uh, you get the overview. Uh, and uh, if you click on continue reading, you'll get more information. It'll tell you a little bit more of the database. It'll tell you how to interpret the index cards that you're finding. And then there's a second index, which is really helpful, uh, which is the pension numerical index, because each of the pension records have, a, have a, a file number. You can go into that index and search under the file number itself. So I can get you more specificity as to the, as to the record. I, I found that very helpful in some of the search I did for this presentation. Then it gives you the source information. So where are they pulling this data from? It tells you it's from the National Archives. And uh, it tells you when it was published on Fold 3, when it was last updated, and uh, gives you the, the National Archives uh, uh, microfilm number, collection number, whatever. So that gives you all the background to what you're about to uh, search for. So at any rate, uh, I said, well, let's look at Civil War. Civil War uh, from the uh, Union side, uh, Civil Civil War Pension Index for Vermont, and it then breaks it down by the um, by the various uh, military sections. And I chose Infantry, Regiment Three, Company E, and there you have the uh, Company E. Uh, cards for the uh, for pension. So I just randomly chose the first one, which is the uh, Allenson H. Allard uh, Civil War veteran. And uh, uh, this will come in uh, handy later when you're trying to get the actual uh, pension record. So it tells you uh, what the company was, E, uh, 3rd Regiment, Vermont Int Infantry, um, the date of the filing on the left column was January 25th, 1878. Uh, the class was an invalid, so he was a, uh, a injured, injured vet. Uh, gives you the application number and over on the right certificate number. And as Wayne mentioned, that's the important part to actually request uh, the uh, pension file from the National Archives. He also had a widow and she has her own application number and her own certificate number. 
And then down at the bottom there, you get the date that he died, November 27, 1916 in Derby, Vermont. So this is packed full of information, genealogically important to your research. So anyway, anyway, just interject there. Go ahead, quick. It's important to remember that that word is invalid. I heard a story about a person who was trying to research this thing and thought it was meant invalid. Oh, I thought it was so, good. I never thought about that. It's like, um, yeah. Anyway, it's an archaic Stop looking yeah. because you thought it was invalid. Well, it's <laughs> really, you, you have to remember that it was invalid. Yeah, it's kind of an archaic term. It's not in use. So anyway, so if you want this and you want it now, you know, <laughs> and money is no object, uh, go to this eservices.archives.gov and create an account for yourself and you can order reproductions. Um, so it's military service and pension records, and the second line down is the federal military pension application, civil war, and later complete file. Um, 80 bucks to get that full file. Very expensive. And in my latest case, what was 100 and some pages? Of course, you got it for free, but yeah. Uh, yeah, no, you'll get the whole thing. Yeah. Um, you need to have extensive patience because yeah. we had somebody come in the library in 2020 and requested you know we went through this and talked about how he could apply and get a, a paper copy of the record and he just got it like a month ago <laughs> so there i don't know if things have picked up you know yeah. post covid here yeah. but uh, it's slow to start with and it was way slower I think they're back, but this is the current right now. So this is the current uh, pricing. So at any rate, once you click on that, you go through it, you get to this point here where you where you where you can order it. And uh, from that, um, so as you can see, the left hand side it wants the debtors' names, uh, first last year of death, year of birth. Uh, the, but the red red asterisk is what's required. So from the uh, record that we pulled up very quickly, you can answer most of them. We can get the first and last names. Uh, we can find the branch of service. Uh, we can get uh, the kind of service and the war in which you serve, but what we don't have is the rank because that was left blank on that, on that card. So we need, to, we need to come up with that rank in order to go further with this. So at any rate, so we would have to pay to find out what the pension actually was. Yes, to get the actual documentation, unless it might be available from another source too. Mm -hmm. And you know, it looks like they probably what they have to do. And, uh, For Civil War, that I mean, they're in the process of digitizing all these records, mm -hmm. so you, it's possible you could luck out yeah. on Poll Three or even on the National Archives website. Um, it, I mean, it's a slow process. Like, it's, you know, I I actually went to the National Archives and, and got six uh, Civil War pension records, and it took my wife and I all day to take pictures of. She, I mean, she couldn't believe it. She said, "You're only going to do six? Yeah, you know, well, where do we see the file? You know, and each file had a couple hundred pages, so." I mean, there's another way you can hire somebody. You can hire a, a genealogist who has access to NARA down in Washington, and he'll go in and do it. Or she'll go in and do it. But you may be able to just get in the same amount of war. You know, it's yeah, you might spend more. Eighty bucks. Is, <laughs> but you'll have it much faster. You'll have it. Yeah. Yeah. So at any rate, um, I went back into full tree and I decided to use the search function, which can be very, you know. Difficult to use sometimes because you get either too many or not at all. Uh, any records. But at any rate, I um, I filtered on Civil War and the Union side, and then I put in uh, Allard Allenson, and it came right up, which was kind of amazing in my mind because sometimes it doesn't. But anyway, there it is. It's 47 pages of his civil service record. I'm sorry. Civil War service record. 
not the pension, but what you know, where you spend his time, where you muster hospitals that he uh, was sent to, and so forth. So, uh, at any rate, let's take a look at this uh, record. And what comes up right away is um, a card with uh, a bunch of case numbers that are all part of this uh, 47 page document. Uh, in it, you will find um, a certificate of disability and disclosure, uh, which will have his rank, he was a private, and other documents, as I mentioned, uh, here's a certificate of disability of discharge. There are a number of, of uh, documents of when he went to the hospital, what he was in the hospital for, uh, when he finally got mustered out. I didn't want to include all of these there, but they're all there on, on the, uh, on the um, full three database. So that was, uh, and then by, by finding his ranking, go back and fill out the rest of the application and submit it with your credit. So, um, so that was uh, what was able to find. I just compiled, you can narrow your search by using the left-hand columns, uh, the collections, categories, titles, and other filters. Um, navigation is important as you're going through these things. Uh, judge when you need to broaden a search or make it narrower. I mean, I got lucky just by putting in his name, but many times uh, the OCR doesn't work that well and it won't come up. So you have to, you know, switch between keyword and name and place and you can usually, you know, get to the, to the record you want. Uh, use wildcard searches. So you put an asterisk, it will, uh, it will, uh, you know, substitute for a letter in a, in, in a, uh, um, this keyword of place and name does not produce relevant results. It's only search for keyword. And those are the things that I found helpful by using this database or the search function. If you're browsing, you just go through all the records yourself, but I can do that. Yeah. Does that asterisk work well, like in Ancestry, if other places so that you might search that wildcard method with the asterisk? Yes. It does. Yes. And sometimes they use different. I think in uh, in ancestry it's the question mark um, for the for the missing letter. If you want to truncate, like you just want to find A L L A asterisk, you'll find everything with that be, that begins with A L L A and then everything that comes after that, all the variations and permutations. Mm -hmm. Just a question. Um, sure. with uh name read. Uh, R E E D is the normal, but it also has I or A just by putting an asterisk or you know, it should find mark. those variations. You find it. Yeah. Ah, here's the question mark on the answer. Uh, That's what I think. And I, I should verify that. But okay. Yes. Right. Question mark. Is that it's a question, question mark? mark. Okay. It's question mark. It's question mark. Yes. Question mark. Yeah. Thank you very much. Save me a lot of trouble now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it hopes you hope you get something. Okay, so now I'm going to go into uh, sort of something I'm passionate about, <laughs> the non-military files for the FBI case files. Um, so just a little background. Uh, in 2008, I, uh, my wife Kathy was at a conference in Philadelphia, so I had a day I was roaming around, you know, doing museums and so forth. So I came across the, the Federal Archives branch in Philadelphia, so I went in and they had this great display on uh, alien enemies in World War I. And they had a computer set up, which was, uh, you can search the footnote.com, which is what preceded, uh, preceded uh, uh, the full uh, uh, three. And uh, in my tenure as the director of the library at Brattleboro, uh, I, had, I was made aware of a, something called the librarian controversy in 1917, where the director of the library was fired. He was fired for supposedly anti German sentiments. So, this was 1917, just before. So, I, um, I started, I uh, thought, well, gee, you know, maybe there's something there. So, um, I um, threw in, well, here's here, uh, before I get into that, the document on the left is from the minutes from the trustees, uh, where they basically uh, uh, have a resolution that says, whereas the trustees have reason to believe 
that the librarian is not wholly devoted to the cause of the United States in the present war and whereas the useless of the library as a public institution and his continued financial support by the town demand of the position the librarian should be filled by a person of unquestioned loyalty. Therefore, <laughs> basically, they they moved the fire her. And um, that's a photo of, of Mary Shacks over Pratt. And um, I was able to get this photograph from her great grandniece, uh, Jennifer Shacks over, uh, who I had uh, contacted. I had sent around letters to every Shaxhober in the area that I that I could find <laughs> with the database that we have the library. And I explained what I was doing. And Jennifer, who was a college student at the time, responded and said, I think that's my great grand aunt. And so she came to the library as this college student and started research and came on her research. She lived, I think, uh, outside of Springfield. And um, and so she sent me uh, this photo, a couple other photos of her of her, of her great grand aunt Mary. And later on, uh, Jennifer became a genealogist. She works for the New England Historic and Genealogical Society. So I, I, I sort of credit myself with this motivation for her to do this work because <laughs> <laughs> it got her really interested in the field. You know, she writes for Vita Brevis, which is the, the blog that uh, NDHTS puts out. You can subscribe to that. It's really a uh, fun blog. And she's really, she's really a good, uh, good, really good genius. Anyway. So, to, um, so in this, um, so I'm looking in this database. So I'll jump ahead to where full three comes in. Uh, looking at the FBI case files for um, this controversy, I'm thinking, you know, I mean, there were librarians in the 2000s became subjects of FBI switches because of the Patriot Act. But I thought like, maybe she was the first person to reach an FBI file in the 19th, early part of the 20th century as a librarian. So um, what I did is I I just put in Brattleboro, thinking that maybe that might work as a uh, as a uh, subject, and I said no results found. What? <laughs> okay, maybe maybe uh, maybe there isn't anything. So I did Brattleboro as a keyword, and up comes this list of. Um, of, uh, documents and the second hit there is the public library in Brattleboro. I said, "Wow, this is you know this looks good." So um, here um, was a document from the Bureau of Investigation Files, which is a report from uh, an FBI agent who is uh, looking at a potential alien enemy by the name of Carl E. Hollander. Who was born in Brattleboro, Vermont, June 25th, 1883, the son of Carl and Susie Von Hollander. Um, it goes on to say that he attended the Brattleboro Public Schools, graduated from high school. And then one of the paragraphs that I was finding hard for to see, uh, the Mrs. Shaxover referred to in Mrs. Hollander's letters to have. Her son has been the librarian of the public library in Brattleboro. Mrs. Shaxover became as obnoxious to the general public because of her pro German that she was removed from the position last fall. So, thinking about this, they have actually letters. BOI has letters that they have found to Carl Hall. I mean, thinking, how did they get these letters? You know, how did they get these letters to? That were from between Carl and his mother that mentioned Mrs. Shaxel. So that meant I needed to look a little bit into this a little bit further. And so, uh, just an aside, in full tree, when you find a document you like and you're, you're a subscriber, you can add tags to that document so you can find it easy and other people can find it. So I started to tag this document the Bradwell Free Library, Carly Hollander, who I didn't know existed before. Uh, Shaq's over, and so these tags will come in handy when you want to go back and find it. Other people can find it too, so uh, that's one thing you can do with these documents. So, at any rate, um, I wanted to find out more about Carl Hollander. So, he's in this FBI case files under this section called Barry's. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, that doesn't mean anything to me or anybody else, but 
it, the OCR did pick up his name. Uh, so anyway, once I clicked on the various, there were over 46 documents on this man in the FBI file. So this was like a, 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 a vein that I hit here that I don't think I would have been able to find anywhere. But um, so all of these uh, images are from the column all under file. And there was a trove of incredible information. Um, they came to Brattleboro. The real investigation came to Brattleboro and investigate this guy. They go to the Tom Clark's office and he find, finds his birth record, which was mentioned in the last file. And um, then it, it actually finds uh, who Mrs. Shaxhover is. And um, they, start, um, they start labeling this man. Uh, in the upper half left hand corner, you see he's a German suspect at this point. Uh, in the document to the right, um, it's uh, another uh, saying that they're basically going to investigate him and uh, they've now labeled him as an alien name and enemy. This is April of 1918. Uh, Mary was dismissed in December of 1917. April, April 1917 is when we, when we entered the war. So, uh, she was she was dismissed a few months after that under uh, and the Espionage Act was what was really kind of driving this this whole thing, which was passed in 1916. So war documents. Um, I was advised by um, this person uh, who's a teacher in the high school of this city. Now we're actually in Fort Worth now because Carl is not a. Carl was an MIT graduate, he was an engineer. So he goes to work for a company in, 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 uh, in Fort Worth. And so they have people looking into him there. And um, the information here is that he is, uh, they, they have some informants watching him. And it says that he's, uh, he's closely associated with Hollander, this, uh, this person, this, this Anna May Hunter. And, uh, and in the end here, they, they've decided by their investigations that he is worthy of, uh, of, uh, of, of foreign investigations. Uh, so um, in the other document, uh, they find somebody who uh, uh, keeps a, uh, uh, a rooming house where Hollander maintains his uh, room. And he's been there for more than a year. He's been absent, and, and, uh, but he still maintains his room. And he's been, uh, it says here, he's connected in an illegal and immoral way with a Mrs. Faye Campbell. So apparently they find out that he's had an affair with a married woman. <laughs> and so they, they report this, right? And in the rooming house, I, I haven't found the document yet, but I believe that they get access to the landlady and they go through, they go through these things and they find these letters. And that's how they find the letters from, uh, from him and his mother. And uh, they actually uh, print some of the, the letters. The, 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 the documentation of the writer transcripted of his letters from his mother. And, and they, you know, they make comments because they're, they're, you know, his father was born in Germany and they are, they are German, German heritage. So, you know, they're, they're sort of, they, they are sort of for Germany in the war, uh, it seems to be, but being an alien, you know, plus even I don't, I don't think that's the case. But anyway, these letters show um, uh, what you know, what what's being discussed between uh, between uh, Carl and his mother, uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Uh, 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 Hollander says Mrs. Shaxover uh, telephones me quite often to tell me about various books that she should be interested in. So you know, they're just talking about books at this point. Um, there's another letter about dear Carl, Mrs. Shack, Mrs. Shackson was per perfectly delighted to hear that the American International Corporation lost the fi final contract. So basically, you know, they were trying to get a contract with the federal government, but, but uh, they lost the contract. It says the chickens are coming home to roost, etc. cetera. And, uh, and there is no one to blame but the pro allies. So, you know, they're, they're, they're showing their political and, uh, feelings here, but you know, it doesn't help Carl at all in the past. 
<laughs> and uh, the last one, uh, the next letter is dated Bravo, Vermont, 52 Western Avenue. Now I know exactly where they live. It's about four blocks from where I live. That house still is there. So when you're down, when you're driving down Western Avenue and Bravo, and you pass Crosby Street, it's one of the houses on the right. <laughs> where, where the land is. It's not 52 Western Avenue because they've changed the address over time. But at any rate, uh, Carl um, passed away in 1968. Um, he never was tried under the Espionage Act. In fact, he went to work for the federal government under the Federal, federal Power Commission. <laughs> uh, he became, uh, and he was actually born in Germany. She was pregnant. They went. They took a trip to Germany. His mother was pregnant. She just birthed him in Germany, so he was actually born in Germany. Uh -huh. So uh, you know. And is Mary German? Mary Schatzover. Yeah. Yeah. She is typical. Okay. Yes, she was. Yes. And uh, he uh, he became a you know he was a civil missionary for the Federal Power Commission. So he was a trustee of the Vermont Historical Society. And he's buried in Meeting House Hill Cemetery. So uh, I actually, when I was doing my work in 2008, I found someone who was the uh, director of the Salt Society in the 60s. And I talked to him. He lived, I don't know if he's still alive. This is 15 years ago, 14 years ago. And he says he remembers Carl, but he doesn't remember much <laughs> uh, because the guy died in 68. So anyway, he wasn't very helpful, but I did find somebody who actually knew. Uh, so it's interesting that a lot of these uh, pieces of information you found in your FBI files were dependent on the FBI investigators, but you don't see anything like it was verified by this person in the right. town who was then verified by right. that person. Right, exactly. So we got away from right. that right. as our due diligence. Our due right? diligence is exactly. Well, my feeling is. While they were going around, what I did is I, I uh, this is not part of my talk here, but I, I mapped out where all the trustees lived in 1917, because I had a list of them. And uh, the chair of the trustees had two doors down from the home office. So I think he knew what was going on. And uh, Mary was a, uh, you know, she was just, she was doing displays and she was giving factual information about Germany about the United States, about the Allies. But under the Espionage Act, we really couldn't show any kind of favoritism from one side to another. And, you know, um, you know, whether or not she was trying to push propaganda, I don't know, but my feeling is she wasn't. And, and uh, you know, I think she just basically got, you know, tried for that. And when they, when the FBI went house to house, which I think they did, they probably got, they talked to this trustee and said, you know, this librarian here, she's in, you know, she's talking to this Carl Hollander guy, and we think he's a, you know, he's a, he's a alien alien. So I think, it, you know, she just caught up in, uh, in hysteria, hysteria at the time. Uh, but anyway, uh, she was the librarian there for uh, 17 years, sorry, 15 years, 1902 to 1917. And was one of the longest serving librarians of, of, the, of, the, of the library. Uh, she never worked in another library again. She kind of got red ball with it. And she actually moved to Bennington and uh, died in, in Bennington. And uh, she buried uh, in uh, Prospect Hill Cemetery. So, uh, Is the library. Do you know if the library has ever done a display or a story about this? Well, you know, I always wanted to, to go to the select board and have her like posthumously <laughs> exonerated. Because <laughs> they, they've done that. Uh, actually, the governor of Montana, some years back, did that to some people who were uh, convicted under the Espionage Act of 1916. He went back and they, they gave them post posthumous pardons. So, uh, anyway. You know, I never did, and I should have. But maybe I'll maybe I'll get motivated again to to do that. But there's a quick question here about it. did did Brattleboro and Hinsdale have a large German population? I believe they did. Um, of course, we know that Brattleboro had a large Swedish uh, as well uh, population. But uh, 
it was an interesting uh, thing that happened. Um, before I retired, we, we got a rather large uh, request from a woman by the name of, I think her name was Esther Shoreline from Hinsdale. And, um, you know, she was, uh, she worked for an attorney in, in Brattleboro, and I, I wasn't familiar with her, but it was, I think, a thirty or $40,000 request to the library. They don't think about it. Um, while I was doing this research, I came across a name of Ernest Schorling of Hinsdale, who was flying the, Ger the German flag above his house and was arrested by the police. And I'm thinking back, you know, maybe the family, because of Mary Schatzover and her German ancestry, maybe used the library and maybe she was welcoming and kind to this family who was being you know, kind of harassed by, by uh, her community. And I was thinking maybe she remembered that. And when, they, when it came to disperse her money, she decided to give it to the Barbara Library for some of it. I mean, that's all speculation. I have no idea. But the fact that I found his name, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that you know, she would, he was a father or grandfather to her. So, anyway. Yeah, it's a good question. I'm not sure, but especially it was a size of overall population. Any other questions? Uh, I would think that it would be of value to get that person pardoned for the descendants mm -hmm. so that it would remove some of the family shame. Right. Yes, this happened, but then she was pardoned. Right, right. I should talk to Jennifer about it because, uh, you know, I've always, as her, you know, uh, uh, Mary and her husband didn't have any children, so it's all over their collateral line to survive. So, uh, yeah, I think that's a good idea. And I should pick that up again. Jerry, didn't you have a meeting with the board of trustees once, I remember, and brought you brought this up and they made a resolution? They wanted to make a resolution. It was in the backyard of somebody's house. Really? Oh, oh, maybe so. When I was, when I was doing they, research, that, yeah. that group of trustees at that time said, yeah, we should do something. Yeah, and then they did a vote and they all agreed, but I don't know. I don't think, I don't think, think we did. did. <laughs> I should remember that. I don't think we yeah, did. go back to the minutes. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. So, anyway, so you think those the other limits on those FBI files, like what, yeah. I mean, by uh, dates, like what time period would it cover, you know? Well, it goes back to 1911, and it goes up, I think, about 1922, and then everything else is not available. You have to file a Freedom like, of Information Act to get to that. Um, like your own FBI file? Your own FBI file? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we should all check. We should all check. <laughs> Yeah. Was it available for 1911 to 22? Yes. So it's World War One. Yeah, basically the uh, World War One. Uh, yeah. there, there was a, uh, a note on one of the slides that said World War One first kind of investigation. Yeah. Yes. Right. That was one of the examples. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> check. They didn't like his editorials. Well, maybe not. <laughs> well, at any rate, um, I was sorry. I, I, didn't necessarily want to get off on that, that rabbit hole, but it, it gave me the ability to, to talk about it. So I decided I could do it. Um, yeah, there's a lot there. I and, never realized that was there. And uh, I well, believe that this Carl, there was a guy by the name of Carl von, Hogs, von Hogsmar, whom they were following on the West Coast. And they started to conflate it. And there are lots of mistakes. They referred to him as Carl Holland. So, you know, they don't even have the right name. And Carl von Hogsmer, they conflate with Carl Hollander. And this guy may have been an enemy. They were an enemy aliens, you know, as we know, they were, they were afraid of the submarines coming in to the, mm -hmm. to the coast and so forth. So, you know, they were, but, you know, they got a little more over, uh, overzealous and they were, you know, you know, casting a wide net and bringing in people. And so they, you know, I think it was a case of mistaken identity. I mean, I mean, you got a job at the Federal, Federal Power Commission, so, you know, but apparently there was no, you know, no great in-depth research into the files. Did 
Shall we do the uh, the puzzles? The, uh, <laughs> you want to do that? Yeah. Yes. Well, um, I, I threw that out. Uh, it came from somebody who attended the, the session last time on Zoom. And uh, so she had a question uh, about a relative that she knew nothing about, really. Uh, so I, I guess I was thinking when it, it, uh, we might be able to help each other out here. Um, I could put the question up again. Yeah, this was uh, awesome. the hits. Um, So um, anyway, I, I I don't I guess I'm curious if anybody was able to find anything. Um, so this uh, she knew nothing about this aunt of hers, whose name was Regina Paula, and uh, but she 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 had a few facts that, and when I saw them, I thought, well, it, it seems like this ought to be doable. Uh, you know, it's not an impossible brick wall that sometimes you run into. <laughs> So anyway, the hints were that uh, she knew that she was married twice and that her second husband was in the Navy and, but, and that she had no children. Uh, that uh, I had thought, I, uh, she gave me a little information. I looked up his uh, her father's uh, petition. This is the aunt's father, actually. Uh, Regina's father uh, had a petition uh, to become a citizen. And so that indicated that she was born in, uh, on the 20th of August, 1908. So her birthday was helpful. And uh, that she was living in Newark, New Jersey at the time. She may have had relatives there. That the father's name was Peter Holler. That, that is a, uh, they were, they were from Poland or Russia, depending on, I mean, I, I guess the Peter was from Poland, but Regina was actually born in Russia at the time. Um, the, the, you, uh, this, you could also, she also knew that the uh, father came to the US uh, from Germany in 1913, and that the, uh, she, she and her mother came probably uh, the following year. And we know that she was found in the 1920 census. When, unfortunately, her name was Virginia Haller. And uh, in any case, that she was born in Russia, Poland. She spoke Polish. Uh, and, and that indicated that they came um, in 1913 and the father came in 1912. And that she had a younger brother. And we knew that she died in Florida between, uh, possibly between 1962 and 66. So I guess the question is, did anybody attempt it and did anybody find anything? Did have any, uh, <laughs> any takers? I think one has in the chat. I think we lost our connectivity with the. Uh, no, man, we lost it. I think phone. they can hear us, but they can't speak to us. I think they got the blue lights. I think they got the blue lights. Yeah, yeah. They can hear us. Yeah, 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 they can hear us.
right. Okay, there's something from Chip. Chip, you can talk if you'd like. I can stop. Can you hear me? I'm not sure you can all hear. Yes, we can hear now. Yeah, yeah I, I found the name in Mississippi, but nothing to link to what you provided. So I hit a dead end. So say that again. I hit a dead end. I found links into Mississippi, um, but not into the region you're looking for. Wanted some help finding something out that they were they were researching and all kind of stuff. Um, so I, I kind of got involved in it though. <laughs> so Chip, what what, so, what steps did you use to get as far as you do you remember? Which step which which steps did you use to get as far as you did? You said you. I, I was using primarily Ancestry.com. In searching uh, names, searching Torrington, Connecticut, but wasn't successful. Yeah, it, it, it was kind of frustrating because I it, I was not able to find. I thought I could find her, you know, find her in 1920. I thought 1930, you know, we'd still find her, but I didn't. Um, but I also used Ancestry, um, and. Maybe it's sort of a little cheat, but I, I always try to look to see if anybody else is also researching the same name. So I did, I did find another family tree with her in it that somebody else had found. So then I came up, that gave me the name of a husband named Gary, Raphael Gary. Uh, so searching him, uh, I was able to find out, I was trying to think of the steps that I went through. Because then I emailed Jerry because he's got a subscription to newspapers.com. <laughs> and, and you came up with uh, a couple of things there. You found uh, some uh, announcement of funeral announcements. So then, that, then we were able to determine that she died in 1963. Came up with a death date and a birth date. Um, and I knew I knew she lived in Newark. I thought for sure it was possible. she might have probably got you know the, the, the difficulty was with this particular case uh, was that she left basically left home when she was a teenager and moved from Torrington, Connecticut to Newark, New Jersey, probably with other relatives. So uh, the uh, so I thought for sure, well, I'll find something there, but I didn't find anything there either. <laughs> the ghost. Uh, uh, I was trying to think of the other processes I went through. So I found a, a Florida index, uh, death index. And uh, I mean, I'm not into it enough that I wanted to send for a death certificate, but you know, um, I'll pass it on for the, to uh, the, the woman who started this whole thing. <laughs> And uh, you know, because I thought, well, maybe that you know, if, if that if that was truly her name, Regina Gary, you know, 
then the death certificate should also confirm you know who our parents were you know we knew the parents so we would know we had the right person so that there's that step that probably still should be done and, uh, the other uh, The other interesting thing that just happened, though, was that what I sent you, a, oh, I know, I sent you a, a, an email asking if you could find Gary's, you know, an obituary or something like Gary. And then somehow you came up with a merit I'll right show, yeah, I'll show you in, in California. I'll show you what came up. And I thought it was like, not. And it wasn't, it, yeah. So this was, with, Jerry came up with this, that, that Regina Mays married Raphael Gary in uh, 19, what, 1934, I think it was, yeah. Um, so then once I had that name, Mays, I, I did a little more searching and then, then I found a ship manifest. And it turns out that the manifest showed that she left Newark, New Jersey, went to New York City, got on a ship, went to Los Angeles, California to join her husband whose name was Mays, Leslie Mays. So then I said, okay, now we got the first husband. And the ship manifest also wanted to know like who a close relative was. And she listed her father's name. So I knew I had the right, right person. So that was like the whole there to find. <laughs> the problem is I still have not found, I haven't found a marriage record for the first husband. I don't know what happened to her. Other than that she got there in the California in 1932. Evidently, that guy was also in the Navy. He was on the USS Cole. And I don't know if it's the same Cole that attacked more recently. Um, and that, um, but then she got married, you know, the second time a couple of years later after she got to California. Married another guy in the Navy. And the only reason I found that, that <laughs> marriage record was when I did the ancestry.com search, and it gives you those hints of other. On the right side, how long? There it was. <laughs> they found it for me. You mean they I found it? You know, and you know, many times those are like erroneous drops. You know, that they're not really the person, but that is not. And I and I still didn't think it was the same person. Yeah, I, I said, oh, I don't think this is it. But you know, it's in California and it's maze. I don't know. <laughs> it, it was part of used that clue. To find it. <laughs> okay. Except that it was, you know, that the age was correct. The age was correct. Yeah, exactly. That's what I find. Anyway, a little serendipity there. <laughs> looking up this information yeah. is knowing, uh, you know, it's he like I tend to get frustrated before I accomplish much and then yeah. I put it down and then it's yeah. a long time before I go back. And it's like I become overwhelmed before I really achieve much. So yeah. it's like knowing how to carve it out in small pieces, I think, is yeah. the key right right um, and i mean the best possible advice i could give anyone is to keep a research log so that might be too much and you come back and say oh yeah i looked here i looked here i looked here and you go back the same <laughs> although sometimes that works <laughs> you know they're always adding new things to databases so you might you find you know, more information yeah, you might, but i am uh, not quite as good about that part but I, what i did with this one and I frequently do actually is I I will copy and paste the whatever I found. I don't always record the things I don't find, which usually they recommend if you're doing yeah. research they, log, they, you know, so you don't keep repeating yourself. But you know, like I would I I copy and paste it in the you know the death index and I found her on find a grave, I could you know find the cemetery, and so I copy and paste that in the, just in a word processing file. Um, That's good. I found the, uh, you know, once I had the name Gehring, I found them in the city directory in, in Washington in 1937. So I was, you know, unless they got transferred from California to Washington. Uh, and he died quite a few years after. And he died, yeah, like she died in 1963. He died in like 1983. So. Um, anyway, so I mean, that. That was helpful, you know, because I have, I just kept feeding stuff into the word processing file that I created so that I could keep track of things that I really, you know, that I, I thought were likely. Uh, 
So yeah, I agree with trying to keep track of what you find. It's a discipline. <laughs> you know, it's hard because you know you're, you're researching and there's a lot of time to document <laughs> before you. But it's like it's just hard. Uh, so anyway, if other people have suggestions or if you if you have a problem that that looks like it might be solvable, but you haven't solved it yet, you want to send that to us. I thought maybe we would try to see if we could work that into a, a meeting here. Right. Future meeting. Yeah. Yeah, we can help, you know, and try to solve some of these uh, brick walls, as they call them. <clears throat> Well, this one had enough information, you know, that just knowing where, you know, where she was born, where she lived, at the right. think of the time, and a, a rough idea of when she might have died, those kinds of hints help. <laughs> you know, in terms of that. As opposed to, uh, you know, I mean, I, I have some that, you know, to me look impossible, but it's all. So I don't think we're not really looking for your worst possible case, <laughs> but something that you think you're having trouble with, and maybe we could put the minds of everyone together and find a solution. It's like a good genealogy is like good restaurants. It's all about location, location, location. <laughs> Carol, you said you have kids. I know, but mine's only solvable with DNA. You know, with DNA. Oh, yeah. So which the DAR wants to accept. This is <clears throat> this is not related to the DAR. Oh. This is on a, a different family. It's on my mother's side and my father's side, and uh, from Scotland. But there's no no information at all. It's an illegitimate birth. So right. so only through DNA am I going to be able to see. Have you have you done the DNA tests? I've I've had a couple of DNA tests, so I've got to, <clears throat> you know, make those quadrants. Right, you know, triangulate. Yeah, triangulate. figure out, okay, this is from my mother's side, this is from my father's right. side, and then do the second cousins, and, you know, I, I have, I've just been about to do that. Right. Ancestry is just added that to their list of tools. I don't know how, how to use yeah, that Yeah, we probably tool. should do something on that, you know, just to... Accurate, but they have they, you know, ways of seeing what what part what part of the DNA comes from your material. Well, I saw the the thing that shows this is from your mother, this is from your father, but it doesn't go beyond that. You know, <clears throat> as far as your heritage, right. but as far as as far as the DNA DNA matches, which ones go with which person? You could see well. This person has these other matches in common. Right. So right. that's a clue there. I haven't figured out. You have it you have it with ancestry.com, your your DNA? I have that and I have my heritage. And you've uploaded it. And I have the jet com. Jet jet match. Yeah, I have that as well. So I would think you could, you could do family tree DNA too. They they allow uploads to their system. I think I could do that too. Oh, yeah. yeah. And all your bases come. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I've just, just, just got it. And then the next is the you know, mitochondrial DNA. Yeah, I haven't, DNA, which you can't do. I haven't done yeah. any further testing, but I was hoping that without doing further testing, mm -hmm. I might be able to figure it out. But just and how far back are you trying to go? I'm trying to go to a great grandparent. Oh, so that's not so hard. It's not too bad, yeah. I know my four grandparents, one of them's father is unknown. So I know gotcha. when when she would have gotten pregnant yeah. and where. That's it. Uh -huh. In Scotland. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this would have been about what, what year? I think around 1900. I'd have to. There's some other records out there. You know. I don't think there's any, the only record. No, I mean, I you know, 
maybe as far as homeless or the hospital. I got her birth certificate. Oh, it says illegitimate yeah. on it. Yeah. But no location. No. Well, I mean, Scotland. I think it was for for Scotland in the Angus area. There is a website called Scott, Scotland People. Yeah. Um, it's a little tricky. To, I mean, it's kind of free to search, but you have to pay to see the documents. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can, um, you know, find my grandmother yeah. but, and her mother. Who's so so you're, you're trying to find the father. I'm trying to find the father. Uh, approximately when she was born. So, the, so the census in the UK is about right, 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 something like 1901, yeah. 1901, 1901, 1911. Maybe it might be worth looking at the census and looking at the people around, you know, oh, the neighbors, the neighbors, mm -hmm. and seeing if there's a witness on a document. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, got, we got some names that maybe can be some DNA, you know, with the names that you see in your DNA, but the names that are neighbors. Wait, uh, the DNA thing is a tricky though. You know, I, yeah, yeah. Can I, it would have to be half relationship. I don't know how they, uh, these people that do, you know, they, they start out with almost nothing and then first family trees up looking for a common ancestor and then build all the trees back down right. again. I mean, yeah. That just yeah, I don't know how to do that. A huge amount of time. I have one. I've tried to, I, in a similar situation where I know the, I know the mother, but I don't know the father. Kind of thing. And uh, I, yeah, I'm just, it's yeah, an it's an adoption. So I, you know, we're, we're just sitting there waiting, uploaded information to all the DNA websites. Just we're waiting for, for like a test. first cousin or something to show up. Yeah. <laughs> so right now it's all like first to fifth cousins or something, you know. And I, don't know, I just can't figure out a start point to be able to, to do all the work that some of these people do. So can you talk about how you select your topics from the Future meetings. We're looking for ideas. We're looking for ideas. <laughs> well, I, I, I really like the discussion nope. that we're having right now on yeah. DNA because my brother and I both have done ancestry. We got wildly different results. Wildly different. Wildly different. Oh. And I so much so I contacted ancestry to say, and I also talked with my mom yeah. to find <laughs> out uh, why these vast differences might occur and they said well you could have more of your father's genes your brother could have more of your mother's genes well, and i was like okay but shouldn't we at least have come some common you know commonality um and then when ancestry sent me an update the update then was more equivalent to my brother's and I thought, okay, so was that just a mistake? <laughs> what happened there? It, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I lost confidence in them after that. Um, well, they changed their, their reference groups. You know, they, ancestors, you know, because they have so many millions of people are testing to refine some of their reference groups. So that's why I'll yeah, do another chance. You know, pick another it, company. I mean, the, hopefully yeah. the reassuring thing is that you had enough yeah, the, 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 the brother, centimorgans. You had to have a certain number of centimorgans to be considered siblings. The siblings. Yes, they yeah. did. So you did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it wasn't like didn't kind of move into the area past it. Then. <laughs> you know the short. You know the short time time morning, so. No, I. But I think this type of conversation would yeah. be really interesting and helpful. Like, how do you check all that? Yeah. Oh, we could do something. Yeah. Sort of do it on the fly with questions and we can. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That we don't have to do any preparation. <laughs> <laughs> I was bit well, I was starting the midnight oil last night. <laughs> no, but I think it would be helpful if people sent us 
you know what you would like to investigate, then we can maybe do some preparation. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, to come uh, up that way. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, well, maybe we can do that the next time. Just kind of work it out. And I think we picked a date, which will be the first Saturday in November. Oh, hopefully eliminating snowfall. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. So remember that, and we're trying to alternate locations. So we'll be at Brooks um, and Brattleboro, and then of course Zoom, so we don't lose. Did you do that here in January? Yeah, probably something like that. <laughs> Yeah, then we'd have to decide on something. But you know, we got Zoom, so that's no fun. Okay, well, we will have uh, this recording available for anybody who wanted to view it. And uh, we can maybe make, uh, you had some, you had some links in this, right? But those links will be live, will they be live on the Definitely on there, but yeah. I could also, uh, I can download a PDF. Yeah. Slash. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we're we'll doing. We'll 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 we have a we have a folder of our files and go in. Besides the video. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Yes, it's on uh, November 5th, 10 o'clock. Eastern Standard Time.